1973 году моего старшего брата Степана съели во время голода людоеды. There's no reason for cannibals and serial killers to exist, but somehow they do. From Jeffrey Dahmer, who raped and ate young boys, to Andre Chikatilo, who cut and ate the genitals of their victims. Here's the worst of humanity. To start this story, I'll be going all the way to Russia for the sentencing of Andre Romanovich, a.k.a. the Red Ripper, or the Butcher of Rostov. <laughs> Andrei Romanovich Chikatilo was born on October 16, 1936, in a cozy village called Yablochnoye in rural Ukraine during a challenging time. The 1930s were rough for Ukraine, renowned as the breadbasket of the USSR. Stalin's efforts to gather farms together made things even harder, leading to a terrible famine. This difficult period, coupled with bombings during the war with Germany, shaped Chikatilo's early life filled with hardships. <laughs> On December 22, 1978, Chikatilo committed his first known murder. He lured nine-year-old Lena Zakotnova into an abandoned shed, attempting to sexually assault her. In a struggle to control her, he ended up slashing her with a knife and ejaculated, revealing his disturbing connection between violent acts and sexual pleasure that would mark his future crimes. Though an eyewitness saw Chikatilo with the victim before her disappearance, his wife provided him with a solid alibi that kept him off the police radar. Another man, Alexander Kravchenko, with a prior rape conviction, was forced into confessing to the crime under harsh interrogation and was executed in 1984 for Lena's murder. After this close call, Chikatilo didn't have any recorded victims for three years, faced with allegations of child abuse and unable to find another teaching job after losing his position at the mining school in early 1981, he worked as a clerk at a factory in Rostov. This job gave him opportunities to target young victims over the next nine years. <laughs> Chikatilo's next victim, Larisa Tukachenko, 17, was killed on September 3rd, 1981, in a brutal manner involving strangulation and stabbing, followed by disturbing acts to satisfy his sexual urges. His pattern of targeting runaways of both genders at transportation hubs and leading them into secluded forest areas continued, where he would assault them, attempt rape, and mutilate them with a knife. <laughs> Ну, как раз все мое детство пришло, это на военные, на голодные годы, так что мы там только лишь бы... Some victims had their sexual organs eaten or other body parts removed, such as their noses or tongues. Initially, he often inflicted injuries to the eyes, believing it would prevent his victims from seeing him even after death. Despite the efforts to apprehend the killer, the attacks paused for some time, leading police to speculate that the culprit might have been arrested for other offences in jail or deceased. However, in early 1988, Chikatilo resumed his killings, focusing mostly on young boys in public places. Under mounting pressure from the media and the public, police increased general patrols, concentrating on areas likely to attract the killer. Despite narrowly escaping capture multiple times, Chikatilo was finally spotted by patrolling officers on November 6, 1990, after his last crime. His suspicious behavior raised concerns, leading to his identification and eventual surveillance due to his prior arrest in 1984. Well, Поэтому в очередной раз я готов Chikatilo was arrested on November 20th, 1990, following more suspicious behavior, initially refusing to confess to the killings. However, after allowing a psychiatrist, Dr. Bukhanovsky, who had created his psychological profile, to speak with him under the guise of understanding his mind scientifically, Chikatilo opened up. He provided detailed accounts of his crimes, even leading authorities to previously undiscovered bodies. He admitted to taking the lives of 56 victims, although only 53 could be confirmed independently, surpassing the 36 cases initially attributed to the serial killer by the police. Yeah. 
как и психическая, сексуальная или сексуальная психическая ущербность, вот эта вся, вот эти все перверсии, и на базе этого все вот эти мне вот уже там на мозги всякие клапаны ставили, там мозги там фиксировали, там они зафиксировали. Declared mentally fit for trial, Chikatilo appeared in court on April 14, 1992, kept in an iron cage to separate him from the victim's families. Known in the media as the maniac, his behavior in court ranged from disinterested to erratic, including singing and speaking nonsensically. At one point, he reportedly exposed himself to the courtroom, but no matter what he did, one thing was clear. The families of the victims wanted his head. They made sure to verbally attack him. It was so bad that they had to keep him in a cage for his own safety. However, you can hear the rage and pain coming from the courtroom. He was in a large iron cage in the courtroom. The cage was to protect him from the rage of the parents of the victims. He was never able to sit at a table and converse with his lawyer the way a Western defendant would have been. These parents wanted him dead. To make matters worse, Chikatilo had no remorse. He instead blamed nature for making him impotent and driving him to murder. Absolutely crazy if I do say so myself. The trial, lasting until August, saw an apparent bias from the judge, frequently overruling Chikatilo's defense. Despite this, the verdict was delayed until October 15, 1990, when Chikatilo was found guilty on 52 of the 53 murder charges. But, Alas, the long hand of justice got to him, and he received a death sentence for each murder. Chikatilo's appeal argued that the judgment on his mental state was prejudiced, but it was unsuccessful. Sixteen months later, on February 14, 1994, he was executed by a gunshot to the back of the head. The next case is of a popular man with crimes that will make your blood boil. His case was not just about murder and cannibalism, it was also about racism and the flaws in our judicial system and law enforcement agencies. is the case of the Milwaukee Monster, also known as Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer was a notorious American serial killer and sex offender, was born on May 21, 1960. Between 1978 and 1991, Dahmer committed chilling acts of violence, confessing to the murder of 17 young men. His gruesome methods included rape, dismemberment, necrophilia, and even cannibalism. It really can't get worse than this. I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh... Despite having a seemingly ordinary childhood, Dharma grew increasingly isolated and antisocial as he grew older. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. Following his parents' separation that summer, Dharma found himself alone in the family home. Seizing the moment, he acted on the dark thoughts that had been haunting him. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to... Uh... I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. In 1978, just three weeks after completing high school, Dharma took the life of his first victim. He encountered a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and persuaded him to come to his home. When Hicks tried to leave, Dharma struck him with a 10-pound dumbbell and then strangled him. After the tragic event with Hicks, Dharma began his studies at Ohio State University, but left after a single term due to his ongoing struggles with alcohol abuse. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being. Following this, he joined the United States Army and received an honorable discharge, as reported by the New York Times. Upon returning to Ohio to live with his father and stepmother, Dahmer's alcohol problems persisted. Eventually, he moved in with his grandmother in Wisconsin, where he faced challenges with employment and encountered legal issues, including arrests for indecent exposure and disorderly conduct. I always 
knew that, that it was wrong. In November 1987, Dharma took another life by drugging a man named Stephen Tuomi, leading to a violent incident during which Dharma claimed to have no memory of the events. This marked the beginning of his disturbing pattern as he actively searched for individuals to lure and kill. By 1991, his victims amounted to 17 men and boys. In July 1991, Dharma enticed three men with money to model for nude photos. One of the men, Tracy Edwards, accepted the offer and accompanied Dharma to his apartment. Once there, Dharma handcuffed Edwards and threatened him with a knife, expressing his intention to eat his heart. Lay back on the floor. Uh, he's just looking at me. He put the knife up under my groin area, you know. And then it's like he's just sizing me up or what have you, you know. Looking at different parts of my chest, things like that. Yeah, and they said, you're going to be this beautiful for me. Edwards managed to break free by fighting back, pushing Dharma to the ground and making a daring escape through the front door, which was unlocked. So I stood up, right, and I hit him in the head like he was sitting just the same exact place as you are. And he had his head like turned more to the side, like, so I hit him right here. Okay, so I hit him right here and his head turned over. And as I was getting up, I kicked him in the face because I guess he didn't know I had martial arts experience too. He quickly caught the attention of two Milwaukee police officers, leading them back to Dharma's residence. Upon entering the apartment, the officers discovered a drawer filled with Polaroid pictures depicting human bodies in various states of dismemberment. When Dharma tried to run, but upon seeing the incriminating photos, the police successfully detained and arrested him, and his reign of evil ended. But the scars of what he did was left for everyone in the world to deal with. Did you ever stop to think that this is someone's brother, nephew, uncle, cousin, grandson, or just someone's friend? I hope you can deal with what you've done. I'm trying hard to. You almost destroyed me. Subsequently, on July 22nd, 1991, Dharma made a comprehensive confession to the authorities, admitting to a total of 17 murders, as recounted by the Los Angeles Times. He faced an initial four first-degree intentional homicide charges on July 25th, followed by eight more murder charges on August 6th, and an additional three on August 22nd, tallying up to 15 in Wisconsin. In September 1991, Dharma initially pleaded innocent and insane due to mental illness, but later altered his plea to guilty but insane in January 1992. Dr. Holly Schiff, a psychologist quoted in A&E True Crime, explained that by opting for an insanity plea, Dharma had the task of proving to the jurors, requiring at least 10 out of 12 jurors to agree, that he was mentally unsound at the time of the crimes. Nevertheless, the families of the victims made sure to show their grievances during the impact statements. He destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. One of the most memorable ones was impact statement from the older sister of Errol Lindsay. Jail, whatever your name is, Satan, I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you. I hate you. You can feel her rage. I can feel it too. The trial started on January 30th, 1992, with closing arguments presented on February 14th of the same year. Ultimately, Dharma was judged to be of sound mind and not suffering from mental illness during the commission of the murders. He was convicted of 16 counts of murder and handed 16 life sentences in prison. After being moved to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin, following his trial, Dharma's time behind bars was cut short. On November 28th, 1994, at the age of 34, he was fatally attacked and beaten to death by another prisoner, a well-deserved end to an evil man. The next case is also as painful as the Jeffrey Dahmer case, so painful that words couldn't convey the emotion that the victim's father felt. <laughs> The pain of losing a loved one is unimaginable, but criminals like Michael Madison don't care. This sick man murdered three women, Angela Deskins, Shatisha Sheely, and Sherylinda Terry, in the most gruesome ways. Today, in the town of East Cleveland, Ohio, police charged a registered sex offender with murder. Michael Madison, born on October 15, 1977, is a convicted American serial killer and sex offender hailing from East Cleveland, Ohio. His reign of terror spanned a nine-month period in 2012 and 2000. 
2013, during which he took the lives of at least three women. But he couldn't run forever. The legal system caught up with him in 2013, leading to his arrest. It was a call about a bad smell that led police to this abandoned home and garage. Two of the bodies were found here. The third victim was found in an overgrown field about 100 yards away. The chilling events unfolded on July 19, 2013, when authorities responded to reports of a disturbing smell emanating from a garage rented by Madison. What they found inside was a decomposing body. The following day brought more horrors. Two additional bodies were discovered, one in a backyard and another in the basement of an abandoned house. Each victim, identified as Shatisha Sheely, Angela Deskins, and Sherelda Helen Terry, was wrapped in plastic and found spaced 100 to 200 200 yards apart. This case was so bad, even the mayor had to do a press conference. As a community, we are dealing with tragedy, we are healing, and we are strong. Police, armed with a search warrant, later uncovered more grim evidence of decay in Madison's apartment. After a standoff at his mother's residence, Madison surrendered peacefully into police custody. The gruesome nature of these crimes echoed the ruthless killings by Anthony Sowell, convicted of murdering 11 women in a Cleveland apartment. Shortly after his arrest, groups of neighbors pitched in to help look for more bodies. Plywood was pried off windows and doors of 40 foreclosed homes to conduct a room-by-room -room search. Fortunately, with the grace of God, there was not another victim found yesterday. The victims, including Sheely, Deskins, and Terry, had heartbreakingly been missing for various periods before their tragic fates were revealed. But soon after his arrest, on July 22, 2013, Madison was formally charged with three counts of aggravated murder. His bail was set at a staggering $6 million, and he chose to forgo his right to a preliminary hearing. However, Madison's legal saga took a more dramatic turn on October 31, 2013, when his attorney, David Grant entered a plea of not guilty to an updated indictment. This new indictment included charges of sexually motivated aggravated murder, with prosecutors seeking the death penalty. Convicted sex offender Michael Madison has pleaded not guilty again in a Cuyahoga County courtroom. This updated indictment was a move that Grant had anticipated, though he had attempted to prevent it. The updated indictment was a hefty 14-count document, with charges ranging from aggravated murder to kidnapping, gross abuse of a corpse, rape, and weapons possession by a convicted felon. Madison Madison's troubled past as a sex offender with a history of drug convictions further complicated the legal proceedings. Well, it is my duty to advise you of your rights and to conduct this arraignment. The trial commenced on April 4, 2016, and on May 5, 2016, Madison was found guilty. The jury wasted no time in reaching their verdict, spending less than a day deliberating before delivering guilty verdicts on all 13 counts. Despite the outcome, Madison remained defiant, informing the court of his intention to appeal the decision to the Ohio Supreme Court. And after you kidnapped and raped and killed, you went on to abuse the corpses of these three victims. You stripped them from the waist down. You folded them in half binding them so that their feet were up by their ears. On May 20th, 2016, the jury recommended that Madison receive the death penalty. This recommendation was upheld on June 2nd, 2016, when Cuyahoga Common Pleas Judge Nancy R. McDonnell formally sentenced Madison to death. However, the sentencing proceedings took a startling turn when Madison was seen smirking in the courtroom. Yes, smirking. This display of arrogance caused an emotional outburst from Van Terry, the father of one of the victims, who lunged at Madison in a fit of rage. But to be honest, can you blame the man? I will not have a bad tear while the shorty tear. Right now, I guess we're supposed to, in our hearts, forgive this clown. He's touched our families, taken my child. He stands there, almost like he was contemplating his next course of action. Then, in a swift motion, he dives towards Michael. Van Terry is so hurt, and he's crying. Again, I ask, can you blame him for his actions? Here's his interview with CNN. Why did you do that? I don't recall doing it. It was, it was an instance of... Um of grieving and I just snapped. The Ohio Supreme Court recently stopped Michael Madison's execution that was slayed for May 2020. This delay followed a motion filed by Madison's lawyers in December to overturn his conviction, a standard move in death penalty cases. But no matter what happens, Michael will spend the rest of his life in prison, just like the criminals in this next case who treated another human like nothing but a slave. It was proved beyond doubt at trial that this was a sadistic murder. 
Finally, we go to England for a case that's as sick and twisted as it gets. From the victims being burnt with hot water, sex trafficked to maggots found eating her body. This case is the epitome of evil. Three people, Ashana Studholm, Sean Pendlebury, and Lisa Richardson, were accused of the horrifying death of Shakira Spencer, a mother who endured unimaginable, suffering in her own home in Ealing, West London. In Ealing last year, a call from a concerned resident who hadn't seen her neighbour for some time resulted in the body of a woman being found. The body was later identified as 35-year-old Shakira Spencer, described as a beautiful soul who cared deeply about people. Over a prolonged period, Studholm, Pendlebury and Richardson subjected Spencer to relentless abuse, described by the judge as an orgy of violence. They exploited her vulnerability, forcing her into servitude, making her clean their homes and run errands at all hours, while subjecting her to physical and emotional torment. This is Shakira Spencer, here in her early 30s, a mother of two. This was Shakira after the campaign of abuse. Their cruelty knew no bounds as they scalded Spencer's feet and made her eat ketchup from sachets, stripping her of her dignity and freedom. This campaign of torture ended tragically in Spencer's death, her body left abandoned in a cupboard. Ashana Studholm, who was pregnant during the abuse and gave birth in prison. Her former boyfriend, Sean Pendlebury, and their friend, Lisa Richardson. Together, they killed her and left her body beaten and burnt by a blowtorch to decompose in her child's bedroom. Once described as beautiful, happy, and healthy, Spencer's life was tragically cut short. Her body reduced to a skeletal state due to the relentless abuse she endured. The attack was so bad that no precise cause of death could be ascertained. But the post-mortem exam found wounds crushing injuries to her ear, cuts to her scalp, and scalding wounds to her feet. They've been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Shakira Spencer. Ms. Spencer's badly decomposed body was later found about two weeks after her death, after neighbours saw maggots coming from her flat. The Metropolitan Police revealed that Shakira Spencer had known the three individuals for a while, their relationships tangled in a complex web, but within less than a year, she found herself completely under their sway. Eventually they were arrested. The details of the abuse was so sick that even her family couldn't believe the details of that abuse. It sounds like a horror film, times ten. Like, you almost don't believe it's real. You think, oh, someone's making it up until you actually sit there in the trial and there was no remorse, nothing. These people are not what we would call humans. It's more, it's demonic. The peak of her torment came during a violent assault between September 9th and 12th, 2022. Pendlebury and Studholm then left her in her home, where she tragically passed away in a cupboard less than a week later. Her death went unnoticed until neighbours noticed a swarm of maggots coming from her flat, leading to the grim discovery of her decomposed body. And on Judgment Day, the judge didn't hold back. The levels of brutality were wholly exceptional and Shakira's suffering was extreme. CCTV footage showed the defendants using her credit card to buy cleaning supplies, trying to erase any evidence of their involvement. Additionally, messages found on their phones contained videos of Ms. Spencer being hurt while others laughed. During Friday's hearing, Ms. Spencer's son described the trio responsible for his mother's death as cruel and evil. She was tortured, enslaved, starved and forced into sex work all at the hands of those she considered her friends. He shared his anguish, recounting the nightmares and anxiety he experienced daily, unable to shake the haunting image of his mother's suffering. He questioned the defendant's lack of compassion and lamented their betrayal, saying they had left his mother to die alone, feeling unloved. Judge Rafferty said that Ms. Spencer's son had described the heartbreak caused by his mum's killing. He never got to say goodbye to her and that the thought of her dying alone and feeling unloved was something he would think about forever, she said. Senior Crown Prosecutor Devi Karan echoed the sentiments of Ms. Spencer's family and friends, acknowledging the suffering she endured. He emphasised the twisted and sadistic control exerted by Pendlebury, Studholm and Richardson over an extended period, expressing hope that the conviction would offer some semblance of justice to Ms. Spencer's loved ones. By law, I must set a minimum term that you must serve before you can even be <coughs> considered for release. This is not your sentence your sentence will be life imprisonment. The starting point for the minimum term of a murder like this is set by law at 30 years. 
During one weekend in September 2022, Shakira Spencer endured the worst abuse from her attackers, as detailed in their trial. They scalded her with boiling water, used a lighter and spray can as a crude torch to burn her face, and repeatedly hit her head with a blunt object. After this horrific ordeal, they took her to her home, where they left her to die in a cupboard. Later, they moved her body to a bunk bed, where it was left to rot. Images of Shakira before she fell under your influence show her full of life, healthy, and smiling. She is unrecognizable at the end. The judge is visible, shaken as she continues. Emaciated, broken, all who watched it will be slow to forget the CCTV footage of Shakira trying to walk on scalded feet in the middle of the night. Judge Rafferty criticised Pendlebury and Richardson for their complete lack of compassion or remorse towards Shakira. She noted their refusal to take responsibility and their attempts to blame each other, showing no signs of regret. Turning to Studholm, the judge described her as aggressive and manipulative, with no mental illness. She also pointed out Studholm's lies to probation officers and her lack of remorse. You, Pendlebury, lived in her flat while she slept in a bike shed. You, Studholm, started as a friend but ended as the worst kind of enemy a person could have. You, Richardson, showed Shakira nothing but exceptional contempt and aggression. Speaking about Pendlebury, Judge Rafferty acknowledged his low intelligence but focused on his active involvement in Shakira's torture. Additionally, Shakira's father, Lloyd Camacho, described his daughter as vulnerable, painting out his family's deep pain. Shakira's mother, Mergia Spencer, on the other hand, compared the attackers to wild animals, emphasizing their lack of remorse. Stand up, the three of you. The sentence for murder is fixed by law and it's a life sentence and I sentence all three of you to life imprisonment for the murder of Shakira Spencer. There will be five years concurrent for count two. Please understand that you may never be released. In the end, they were jailed for life and mandated to serve a minimum of 34 years. 